Okay, so. Okay, so learning objectives for today in this lecture are going to be what are differential abundance methods, uh, the importance of applying false discovery rate correction, appreciate the pitfalls in microbiome uh, application of differential abundance methods, ways to maybe uh, address those issues. And then after that, we'll talk a little about pie crust and how maybe you can predict function from 16S data. And importantly, some of the limitations around that. So differential abundance testing is uh, literally just identifying which taxa are different between two or more groups. And fundamentally, compared to the things we were talking about with alpha and beta diversity, which are maybe a bit more complex and computationality and, and PicoAs, this is really one of the most simple questions you could ask, right? Like it's literally saying, hey, what bacteria are different between you know, this group and this group? I mean, that should be pretty straightforward, right? Um, and we can visualize, obviously, uh, microbiome data like, uh, yeah, like this. And this is just a few samples from some tumor tissue. This is lung cancers. And this is saliva that we just produced recently. Pilot data for a grant. So we're going to get it this time. We'll see. Um, and obviously, between these two different sample types, right, there's a lot of different bacteria. So we see variation across people tremendously. Uh, and then we see differences between these two groups. In this case, we have eight samples in each. Just ignore those low and high things at the bottom for right now. And so you can imagine, okay, we want to say, hey, we see more of this particular genus Massilia in the tumor tissues, but not all of them, right? There's a lot of variation there. Is that statistically different compared to saliva, right? Or what taxa in saliva do we not find in the tumor tissue? A very basic question, uh, a test question that we can do at different uh, taxonomic ranks. So we could ask this at the genus level, which is, uh, which is these. We could do it at the family level. So we could collapse that information to the family level and then compare uh, what families are different. We could do it at the ASV level. So we would have specific ASVs. We could sort of do it at the species level. We don't need to do that too much with 16S data because we just don't have enough of the data with taxonomic labels at the species level. So you sort of miss out. So you usually go from genus right straight down to ASV. So that's great. And then we can ask ourselves, you know, what, what kind of test would you do? And the reality is, is you could take you know, and sometimes we do that, we would just visualize, you know, the data as a box plot across your groups. And you'd be like, well, maybe I could apply a t-test, right? That, that sounds good. Uh, and then I remembered that it doesn't have a normal distribution. I remembered it this time. And uh, so then we could apply maybe some sort of non-parametric test that we typically do for those types. But then compositionality rears its ugly head once again. And uh, then there's a lot of different differential abundance methods to do that. Okay, so when I say differential abundance methods, I'm talking about things like t-tests, non-parametric tests that do two groups or more. An important aspect of this, and usually this applies to a lot of sequence data, um, but just to make everyone aware, uh, is that false discovery rate correction is really important. And because we're doing a lot of different tests in some of these comparisons, we need to correct for all those tests that we're doing, right? So if we take it back to some basic stats and you think about a p-value and p-value maybe of 0 0.05 and using that as a cutoff, we define that p-cutoff because essentially that's what we deem to be an all okay rate for accepting the fact that there's a 0.05% probability that we may identify something as rejecting the null hypothesis that didn't, right? We could use a 0 0.01 and be more stringent, but 0 0.05 we use a, a lot, or maybe we even relax that to 0.1. But essentially that works okay for one test. But if you repeat that test over hundreds or thousands of different objects, like taxa, right, in a sample, and we run a test essentially for every one of those taxa, especially at the ASV level, we're doing hundreds or thousands of tests and because of that, that's going to increase the probability of finding things that are statistically significant that really aren't. 
right? So that's the whole idea of false discovery correction. So if we had a thousand things, we would expect to find by that probability 50 significant findings that would be actually false. So because of that, we need to, you know, have methods that either include multiple test correction in them, or you can apply it afterwards. Classic ones would be something like Bonferroni, which is just very simple. It's literally a multiplying your p-value by the number of tests you do. It's also thought to be just too conservative. You lose a lot of statistical power. So because of that, you'll see people usually applying something like a Benjamini, Benjamini Hopperk uh, FDR correction. Uh, and there's other corrections out there. The, the take home message is, is that you need to be applying something. Uh, and usually the telltale sign is that most uh, corrected p values are reported as q values. Okay. So something to watch out for and, and be cognizant of. Okay. So this seems pretty straightforward. Great. There's some methods out there. Some are probably better than others. Uh, why do we have to talk about this too much? And it came to our, um, well, we started to get frustrated a little bit with it because there's lots of tools out there that you pick. And we started to notice that the tools really wouldn't agree much on what things it found. And then there wasn't an agreement about which kind of uh, differential abundance test we should use. So we sought out to you know, do a big comparison of the tools across real data to come up with some conclusions about you know, what should we do going forward. So this paper was published uh, a couple of years ago. And what we did in this paper is we looked at 38 different data sets. Uh, this was all 6 nest data, real data, uh, and uh, 10,000 samples across these different data sets. And these data sets include human, environments, things like that. And we limited it to just two group tests. So we didn't even get into you know, how to find differential attacks across multiple groups. Just we focused on two groups is, is kind of simplest. And then after that, we then compared essentially 14 differential abundance methods. Some of these are repeated a couple of times because we tested them with different uh, normalization methods beforehand. Some of them are, you know, things that we wouldn't really apply, but we included anyway here. So you see your classic t-test, you see a Wilcoxon test, which is a non-parametric test that's used in a lot of different fields. And we have tested it with like rarefying and also applying a CLR transformation. We tested a few things that are, you know, you would have seen a lot in a lot of microbiome studies, things like LEFC and Maslin. Uh, we also tested some uh, newer compositionally aware tools, things like Adelex, Ancom, and CornCob. Some of these come from RNA-seq world, uh, and some of them have been developed for microbiome data. And then we basically just compare, you know, applying these tools across all this data, how well today agree. And going into this, I think we thought, okay, some are going to be pretty lenient, and some are going to be conservative. Can you conserve? Yep. Uh, and we're hoping that there'd be a nice overlap and we would just move on with our lives. And of course, it's not quite what we found. Uh, and so here's a table basically showing all of the different data sets that I just talked about as uh, rows. So they're just sort of obviously abbreviated to give you an idea of what they are. And this is done at the ASV level. And each column is a different tool that, uh, that we applied. And the number in the matrix here represents how many ASVs were found significant by that tool in that data set between the two groups. So what we see here is that, first of all, if you look across any row, you see quite a bit of variability in the number of ASVs that picked up as differentially abundant by these methods. You also see that some tools definitely seem to be predicting a lot of uh, taxa, a lot of ASVs. So we see that EDGAR, LEFSI, and these Lima Voom tools are picking up more ASVs than some of the other methods. And we also see that some are a bit more conservative. So things like ADLX and ANCOM tend to be a bit more conservative in the number of ASVs that we found. But it is pretty terrifying to see such variability, right, across a table. It means that if someone applied, you know, left C on one data set, and then someone else repeated the same exact experiment, everything else is the same, right? You know, no other biases. They applied a differential, a different differential abundant method. They would get drastically different results, and that obviously makes it hard for finding out, hey, you know, like how many 
how many IBD papers has there been? And people are trying to find, figure out which bug it is that's, that's really key to it, but they're reporting this, these different taxa and someone else reports different taxa. Well, that's, that's problematic, right? So we thought that maybe at least there could be some consistency between the tools, right? That the core of the things they find at least all overlap. Um, and that's sort of not really the case. And so what this is just showing is the proportion of significant features that were identified by each method. And then the consistency score is just like how many tools found that same taxa. So in a perfect world, you'd have 100% at um, all 14 tools. And so what we see is that some methods like Lima Voom and Liba, these two Liba Voom methods, basically most of them are only found in that tool, right? They're found by two tools. It's just the two different ones with the two different normalization methods. Wilcox and CLR, same thing. So essentially those are features that weren't even detected by other methods. They were just detected only by them. The ones that were a bit more conservative, you know, at least up to 40% of those features were identified as conserved uh, between the other tools. But that still means even with those, in, within those tools, 60% of the features they found weren't identified by you know, all the other tools. And then lastly, uh, what we did was we tried to get a handle on you know, what maybe the false positive rate is. And so for this, we just took six different data sets. We took just one of the groups, just the sort of control group, right where we hope to not find a signal. We actually randomized some of the samples within that. And then we asked um, essentially how many ASVs do we detect? And we predict that we shouldn't find any signal within those. And for a lot of tools, they did pretty good. They controlled the false positive rates. Uh, oddly enough, there's some really weird stuff going on with Lima Voom, where essentially it works most of the time and then it would go off really haywire and just report a lot of significant features. Uh, and we see Edge R and Lefsey reporting um, sometimes uh, up to two or five percent ASVs as significant when when they really shouldn't be there. Okay, so that's pretty depressing. Uh, <laughs> and then the question is, okay, that's great, Morgan. What should I do? Uh, you know, what's the best way forward? Uh, and of course, like, the typical answer in bioinformatics, it depends. Uh, and so it does depend a bit on what you're aiming for, right? I think the knowledge that these tools do different give different results, I think is half the battle, knowing that uh, unless we're using the exact same tool, we're gonna find different taxa. It also comes down to your tolerance for false positives um, or false negatives essentially, right? So if you know that it's okay, I don't mind reporting a whole bunch of taxa because I'm gonna do something else with them later on to maybe validate. I'd rather have too many than too few. Sure, that's great. I'd rather, um, I'd rather do that, but it could be problematic as well, right? You don't want to have too many things to talk about when there's there's not a lot of signal. One thing I didn't show the data for here, but we showed really clearly in the manuscript, and that's why we sort of apply filtering a lot with our data, is that filtering uh, the data, the ASVs out that are sort of rare, really improves signal overall. It helps with the consistency score, and it helps with that heat map at the very first I showed, drastically reduces a lot of those false signals. And so one way to do that is what we do is where we apply a, pre a prevalence filter. So in the paper, we use a 10% prevalence filter, which just means that any ASV that's not in at least 10% of the samples basically get removed from the analysis, right? And the idea being, if it's only in 10% of our samples, it's hard to identify for sure whether it's a robust, essentially, uh, taxa that's significantly different. So that's that's one approach. And then what we're hoping to do is be like, oh, everyone should use this tool. <laughs> or I guess if we were more stats savvy, we would come up with our own new tool, but I'm not quite that stats savvy. savvy. Um, so what we've been doing in the meantime is essentially running multiple tools and actually just reporting on those. Just clearly in the manuscript saying, we ran essentially three tools this is their agreement or disagreement instead of just picking one and then reporting only one. So what that looks like is um, something like this maybe. So this comes from some work that Robin's been doing with uh, saliva and uh, 
mental health and children, but we've also published a few papers where we've done this approach as well. And so for this example, we've run three tools, ANCOM, Maslin 2, and Adelx 2. And essentially then we just report the taxa that are identified by any one of those methods. But then we highlight essentially how many of the methods also identify that same taxa, right? So now we have a, you know, we have a short list of interesting taxa across different um, diseases or phenotypes that we're interested in. And then we can sort of get maybe a bit more, hopefully, robust feeling about whether this is a true signal or not, right? So this homophilus one down here in depression, well, only a single tool pick that up. Maybe we don't put as much weight in that. Uh, some of these associated with anxiety were not picked up uh, by the Adelex, but then some of them are found across all three. Is it a perfect solution? Not really. This is not the future of statistics by, by any means. But I think at least it's um, it's a bit more clear and transparent, essentially, to the reader of the variability within your data set. Yeah. And I don't really have a better solution than that now until you know someone comes up with better methods in the future that that we can all get behind. And they are coming out. Uh, they continue to come out, and and so we'll see how we'll see how the um, how the research area develops. Okay, any, uh, so that's it for differential abundance. It's a bit depressing, I know. Any questions about it? Anyone have a favorite differential abundance method that they've used in the past already? Ancon, yeah. What's that? G6. I don't think that was in my list, was it? Ah, oh, yes, yes. Um, yeah, so I, that's good. Uh, I think the only one that was a little scary and uh, is probably Lefsey. It was used by a lot of microbiome studies and we see pretty high false prediction rate there. So yeah, maybe we want to reassess that one. Okay, great. Well, then we're going to move right into sort of jumping off of that. That sort of is the end of, I guess, our, what I would say, our routine 16S analysis that concludes that. Uh, and then the last little part I'm just going to talk about is functional prediction. So uh, if we think about our data, we can think about, you know, if we were doing 6 nests, I know we talked about 6 nests a lot here, but I, I mean all amplicon sequencing, we eventually do, you know, a lot of bioinformatics steps to get to this point of where we have a table of ASVs by samples, right? There's a lot of bioinformatics steps in here, you know, all of them by heart now with the filtering and the uh, merging and the uh, denoising and the more filtering. <laughs> Uh, but eventually we do get to a table and then we tackled a lot of this this morning, essentially being like, okay, how do we make rare fraction curves? How do we interpret that table? How do we make sense of it? How do we visualize it with against all samples? Uh, we could make stack bar charts. We could, you know, specifically focus on one taxa and look at the changes across that across multiple groups. And enter sort of metagenomics here, which uh, would be the topic of the advanced uh, a bit, uh, but it's also something you might be considering even if you had 6S data. And in the near future, you're like, oh, maybe I'm not gonna do much of it. Obviously those two components are quite important, but metagenomics in theory gives us the same sort of table, right? It gives us taxa by samples. In theory, it gives us better resolution down to species level. Uh, unfortunately, the table from 6S and metagenomics wouldn't agree precisely. Uh, that's a topic for another day. But the other big benefit to metagenomics is you get functional information. And by functional information, I mean sort of at the DNA level, gene abundances and gene pathways that are encoded within that community, right? So instead of essentially all the taxa, now we think about all the different functions, which ones are there, how many times do we count a particular gene, how many changes do we see in a, in a pathway across our samples? And we can actually do a lot of those same analysis, the same sort of visualization techniques we just did. You can do a peak away with functions instead of taxa. You can do rarefaction of functions. You can do differential abundance definitely with functions, right? Yep, question. Like, just the yeah, no, it's a really good argument. Um, that's very true. So when I say function, I, that's why I was trying to say DNA. <laughs> yeah, so often people will, you know, quantify 
you know, the, the change in a particular gene across samples. Uh, and then, right, but we're not measuring transcripts. We're not measuring RNA levels and we're not measuring proteins. We're not measuring metabolites. We're just measuring an increase in the number of gene copies for sure. Enter metatranscriptomics would be, you know, over here. And then we would, we would measure those transcripts, right? Um, but anyway, even so, if you think about, you know, microbes exist for a certain reason, they're there, if they're selected for, in theory, an increase in certain pathways could lead to, yes, further experiments where you'd be like, oh, this is interesting. You know, we see a, an increase in whatever, nitrotooling degradation. And so you can go down this pathway of focusing on to say, oh, do we actually see metabolites tied to that? Do I see expression changes? Um, and so the idea, I guess, with functional prediction is that can we take the 16S data from here and then make predictions about what this table would look like, right, without doing the metagenomic sequencing? So uh, I did this in my postdoc. I uh, developed a tool called PyCrust in 2013. It feels like eons ago. It sort of is now. Uh, and then PyCrust 2 was developed by, by my PhD student once I had my uh, lab. Uh, and PyCrust has been used a lot. I think it's over 10,000 citations. Uh, and then we'll talk about the love-hate relationship in a, in a second, but we're going to talk about how it works first. So the whole idea here is to make these predictions, we uh, essentially leverage our known information about microbial genomes, right? We've been sequencing microbial genomes for years now. We have huge databases thousands of genomes. And so the idea is, why can't we use that information to say, well, we know what tax that we have, right? We, we, we generate this table from our 16S data. And if we think about this table, if I know that this ASV is 100% identical, say, to a particular genome in my database, well, then can I then use essentially this genomic information within this genome to essentially make predictions about how much that ASV is contributing those, those gene abundances to my community? And so at 100% identical, maybe it works pretty good, even though we know you can get gene differences between things with 100% 16S identity. But you might have a pretty good handle on what genes are in a typical genome if it's that close. But then, of course, the question gets a lot more complicated if you don't have that genome in your database. What happens if it's only 80% similar at the 16S level? Uh, you know, how much can we trust the genes in this genome to be a good predictor? And so that's where essentially PyCrust uses this information and then tries to improve upon these cases where uh, we don't have great genomes. Okay, so to do that, essentially, we actually build a tree very similar to how we built a phylogenetic tree earlier this morning by this placent method. It's exactly the same. We have a reference 16S tree, and then we place our 16S sequences into that tree uh, using a very similar method. So that's actually the same step. It is phylogenetic based, and so that's important because we're not trying to map things through taxonomy at any stage with pie crust. It's all phylogeny based. And then the sort of real magic happens at this stage where essentially there's a process where you do hidden state prediction. So what that looks like is given the phylogeny, uh, and then you have some sort of traits on the tips of this trees. So all the tips are thought to be here are reference genomes for a single gene. So pick your favorite gene in your head, we call it gene X. And then zeros means it's absent from that genome, one means it's present, and two means there's two copies of it, three, et cetera, okay? So this is just predicting one gene. And then the tips here are where we mapped our, our 16S ASVs to this tree, okay? And then the idea is to use you know, phylogenetic approaches to predict now what we think the state for this particular measure would be at these tips. People have done this in the past, mostly from uh, interesting, like wanting to know ancestral state prediction, knowing of, you know, when did tails uh, evolve? Like what ancestor had a tail? And then you can do essentially these approaches. 
So to do this prediction, there's different methods out there. There's maximum parsimony, maximum likelihood, and others. Um, very nicely, in 2018, a different group made this caster package, which uh, greatly sped this up. And by default, uh, PyCrest2 just uses maximum parsimony. But essentially what happens here is the algorithm looks at these question marks and goes, what's the most likely occurrence? What's the most likely trait here? So for this one, where there's zero, zero is one, maximum parsimony would say zero makes sense here, right? That there was one evolution point where somehow this gene was obtained. Over here, it's very close to this tip, so we would probably predict two. Same thing with this one over here, there would be three copies. And then that's repeated for every gene in the genome that we're looking at, yeah? And then after that, essentially then we're just doing some, uh, you know, just collection of the data together into essentially division and multiplication of, of matrix tables. So the first one that's kind of interesting is we actually correct for 6NS copy number, even though we said that most people don't usually do this, we do it for our functions because why not? If we're making functional predictions, we might as well try to correct for 6NS at the same time to make our functional predictions better. Uh, and so what we do is we actually predict the 16S copy. So again, we know how many copies are in many genomes. And then we predict for your ASV how many copies of 16S we think is in it. And then we then correct your ASV table by simply dividing by those copies, right? So this one, this one here has five copies. So instead of 10, it becomes two. You simply divide our number of ASVs by that. So we call that a normalized ASV table because the word normalized isn't used enough already. And then we say, okay, let's get into the functions. And then we just say, okay, now what do we do? Well, the magic is that we've done this step just previously where we predict now the contents for every ASV in our table. So we have, in this particular case, they're keg orthologs, but it could be other types of gene families. And then we simply multiply together uh, the, the numbers to get our total amount. So if we're interested in how many of keg ortholog 0001 is in sample one, well, then we just need to add up all of the keg orthologs in these genomes multiplied by their presence of their ASVs, which is calculated here. So it's two times four plus one plus one and two times two, add those together, you get 13. Likewise for the other spots in this matrix. And essentially this is then what would get output by PyCrest. So most of the magic happens, obviously, in the previous step. This step just combines it all together. Any questions about that? Yes. Uh, no, you can do it with any part of the 6NES. Because the reference tree that we use is a full-length uh, 6NES reference tree. So it's just like... It's identical, essentially, to what we did this morning, where you're placing a fragment of the 6NS. Like, like a regular run, and I got relatively good, like, data back, like, I could just do this. Uh, yep. Yep. And usually you would use the denoise sequence, error-corrected sequences. Yeah. And just like anything else, it's dependent on how high quality that is. Yep. Oh, uh, no, it's just the example I give here. Oh. Um, uh, actually, in the lab, you'll be using MetaPsych. Yeah. Um, and so it, it just comes down to where we pull the reference genomes from and what annotations we get for those genomes. Do you get to assign the data to the algorithm? Um, you... In theory, yes, you can. <laughs> it's a little tricky. It takes a little bit of work, but yes, there's nothing about it that is limited. So if you had a large database of genomes with a particular function you're interested in, I get this question a lot because sometimes there's newer functions that aren't in our pre-calculated yeah, ones. Yeah, in theory, you can just drop it in. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so then I don't want to go about this too much because the paper's been published a while, but uh, I, as you know, this leads a little bit to like you know the confidence in it and things. And so the the primary method we assessed it was by essentially doing taking samples where we had done both six nest sequencing and shotgun metagenomics, and then we asked if we take the six nest data, predict gene families and pathways abundance with pie crust, 
compare that to what we would do with the metagenomics, which I know we haven't done in this workshop yet, and predicted functions, and then just compare those tables, literally those two tables, like at the first of those arrows, how well do those two things align? Yeah. And I should say that, you know, this process over here is not perfect, <laughs> which we'll learn about. Uh, so using this as kind of a gold standard is, is um, uh, conservative. And then, so basically we do that and we do that uh, across a few different data sets. And because after PyPress 1 came out, there was some other tools. So Tax for Fun 2, PanFP and PyFillin all came out after PyCrust 1. So we had to you know, compare our method to theirs. Uh, and so this is just an example of essentially comparing those two uh, matrices using Spearman correlation and then looking at those accuracy of those. Uh, and so we see PyCrust 2 is doing a job. And then we tested that uh, across a series of other types of uh, projects. So Cameroonian is a human-based, HMP is also human-based, uh, Indian is also human-based, and then we had mammals, so like host-associated, ocean, primates is obviously host-associated as well, and then we had like um, soil samples, which we thought would do a lot worse because there's a lot more diversity there. And so we report on the accuracy across those. Again, I'm not gonna go into too much detail here. It's, it's been published and there's better times to spend our things. I also wanna mention that you can predict non-gene family things. So anything you know about the genomes, you could make predictions on, right? So we pull the data from IMG for this particular one. IMG has these nice other microbial phenotypes that are like at a much higher scale, essentially. So things like denitrifiers, glucose, utilizing aerobes, things like that. And so you can make predictions at that scale as well. And that's just showing this. Okay, great. Any questions about how it works? Wonderful. Okay, so pie crust, uh, essentially, you know, some people love it. Yeah, uh, it's great. Some people love it. It's classic. It's, uh, it, I like it still. Like it's a pretty cool tool to me because uh, not just because I developed it, but because, you know, I loved it because you could leverage, you know, all this existing information to sort of make predictions and, and make things better. Because essentially before this, and people still do this a lot, they make assumptions about the tax that they see, right? So you've read, if you read a microbiome paper, they'll say, oh, we see a lot more of this tax. And these tax are known to do this. So we think that could be the, the functions they're doing, right? But this is just doing it at a much more detailed scale. Um, but yeah, so... The, the real answer too is though that there's a lot of people that don't love it, right? Uh, for a couple of major reasons. So one, they don't love it because essentially um, we know, like I sort of started with that, that six nest gene is not a perfect predictor of function. And so they have a tough time thinking that these predictions are meaningful in any way, even though lots of people showed it different different approaches. Truthfully enough as well, sometimes they don't love it because it's dependent on the project that you're applying it to. So people say, oh, okay, for human stuff, no problem. We have a pretty good set of reference genomes, but there's no way you can apply it to your soils because we don't know what's in the soil. We don't have good representation. And true enough, um, it doesn't work as well on environmental samples. Uh, and so, you know, the important thing is to, to understand the limitations of it. It is a tool and you will get pushback sometimes depending on your reviewers. <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> um, so the important thing is, yes, so we already talked about this, just like metagenomic data, it's not, uh, you know, anything, the functions it's predicting is, is limited to the same thing as metagenomics, right? We're talking about gene abundances and pathways. We're not measuring proteins or metabolites or transcripts. On individual genomes, their prediction accuracy could be low, right? So this is conglomerated across all the ASVs. If you pulled a single ASV and said, oh, I just want the predictions for this, I get a little worried about that. So, you know, the predictions on a single ASV could be a bit lower. And the, the big one here that I don't think people appreciate is that detail here is that functions that we study are in databases and those are well annotated and characterized. And the classic thing that people point at is things like E. coli, where we sequence another E. coli genome, has the same exact 16S sequence, but we know there's like an extra 10 or 20% of the genome have different genes. So they're like, 
and it's rightly so. Like you sequence another genome and you get, you know, 10% more genes. Well, how can you make predictions on that? The reality is those that that part of the genome that fluctuates a lot is not really well studied. Yeah, we don't actually have them in functional databases. If you try to characterize the function of those things in the periphery, like 50% or more won't be annotated with any sort of functional database. So our ability to predict is based on the things that we know. It doesn't predict all the things we don't know. So the take-home message here is that if you do use it, uh, no, understand its caveats, be sort of maybe restricted in your language, and then also realize it's just like anything else, right? You're hypothesizing, you're making hypotheses, you're generating hypotheses that you can then validate further. Maybe you validate them with metagenomics because it seems worth following up on. Maybe you test some enzymatic enzyme assay on the sample to say, oh, does it, does it look like this, right? So it usually comes down to language and not sort of banking your whole paper on, you know, one pie quest result. All right, does that make sense? All good there? Okay, and then lastly, I just want to give an example of where, uh, where we applied it, and I, I think it's underappreciated a little bit, is that for metagenomic data, we talked about this, I think Robin talked about this, metagenomics is sequencing all the DNA a sample, right? So that works great for things where it's mostly microbial, right? Soil, stool samples, or what happens when you have a lot of other host DNA? 16S isn't really a problem too much because you amplify up the thing that you're looking for. But if we look at saliva or skin, the vast majority of that DNA is going to be host associated. Or if you're doing a plant or an animal, it could be significantly DNA from that host. And now if you do shotgun metagenomics, now 50%, 90%, 99%, 99.99% 99 is going to be host DNA. So obviously that drives up cost a ton and it makes our ability to do, well, you should just done metagenomics, which is already 10 times more, but now it's gonna be a hundred times more to account for the sequencing death issue, costly, yeah. And we also have cases where we, you know, we just have the 16S data in hand already, maybe we can't generate new, new sequencing. Okay, so um, this is just one last little thing. This came in from a paper right around the same time we were publishing PyCrust 2. Uh, and this was looking at um, bacteria and tumors. This was not out of my lab. This is out of uh, Rabbit Strausman's lab in the Weizmann Institute. Um, and basically they took previously biobanked cancer tumors and were showing through a lot of different techniques that it looked like there was bacterial DNA in them. And they used flit, uh, uh, fish to identify that they look like real cells. And so it was obviously a, a big paper. This is just showing... Um, bacteria amounts. This is actual absolute data. This is not sequencing data here of uh, different types of tumors. And so this kind of made a big splash. And towards the end of that paper, you know, they wanted to make some predictions about, hey, you know, is there functional differences between uh, across the different tumor samples? And so we, we use PyCrest 2 to make those predictions. And essentially the, the heat map on the left is just showing that these are all these metacyc functions and showing that there's variability across the tumors. Uh, and then they picked out this example um, where basically looked at specifically at lung cancer. And then they split up lung cancer into current smokers versus those that never smoked and looked for particular uh, pathways that were predicted by PyCrest, whether there's association there. And so it was kind of interesting in that basically found um, different uh, pathways that are associated with uh, essentially smoking, so nicotine degradation, tooling degradation, phenol degradation. And then we also found a few things that are associated with plant-related uh, microbes, so glycine by synthesis. Does that mean that, like, for sure, we know that microbes that are in those tumors are metabolizing that? And, like, we don't. Like, you'd have to follow it up by other experiments. But sure enough, it's a pretty cool experiment that... Didn't, you didn't have the data for anyway, and you sort of got for free, right? And then you could follow it up with, with other experiments, whether that be sequencing, whether it's metabolomics, uh, or whatever have you.